you're probably wondering why we are looking at it in this format and it looks different than all the, all the other formats. Well, this past Sunday, we had some technical issues and we were unable to actually record um, the session with sound. And so um, this is me recapping things that we talked about on Sunday night. Uh, before I begin, though, I'd like to take just a couple of moments just to recap what we've talked to talked about um, so far in the last three sessions, because I have some really good news. We are four weeks into the study on Jonah, and this week we are officially going to uh, actually dive into Jonah. But first, I just want to recap and review some of the things that we've discussed up to this point. Um, the first couple of weeks, we talked about the Hebrew scriptures, the Tanakh, that T-N-K um, um, acronym that stands for the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim, and how Jesus actually saw this as his scriptures during the time that he um, lived in physical form here on this earth. And the T Tanakh, when looked at in the ordering of the original um, Hebrew layout for, for the ancient Jews or the ancient Israelites, left you knowing that you needed a new prophet that was greater than Moses and greater than Elijah. And you would discover who this person is or whom this seed of the woman would be by meditating day and night on the law, on the prophets, on the scriptures. And, and so by doing that, we need to read every single account and every single book throughout the Hebrew scriptures through that lens. It's that lens that the ancient Israelite would be looking for the Messiah, the anointed one, the one who would come from the seed of the woman that would ultimately crush the serpent um, himself. Uh, and so that is what we're left thinking of or looking towards um, when reading scripture. You see, the ancient authors and, uh, and editors or redactors were also not in any way um, antiquated or uh, old-fashioned or somehow less educated than uh, the modern readers. So we dispelled some myths in that second week when we talked about the ancient authors, because this is divinely inspired word of God, the ancient authors had a certain set of tools that they could implement and use at any particular point in time. And by understanding the tool set that the ancient authors had and used, uh, at their uh, at their advantage there, you can begin to understand ways to study this particular thing that we call scriptures. You see, when we begin to understand how the ancient authors are implementing their tools, we are able to gain um, understanding and knowledge. The way that Proverbs one says it, when it says. Um, to gain understanding and wisdom and knowledge and is and able to understand the Proverbs themselves and those hidden riddles, those hidden things throughout Scripture. Um, suddenly, when we understand that tool set that the authors are trying to um, implement, things that seem strange in their own context suddenly is illuminated by something that you may have read in a previous event or previous narrative. Um, that, that was given throughout scripture. And, and so uh, we discover these things when we, when we pay attention to the times that the authors are what I've, what I've entitled as uh, winking at us. Uh, they wink at you by using repeated words and phrases. You know, they'll say certain words over and over and over in a small amount of, of passages or verses. Uh, they will also repeat themes, um, whole Themes like the book of Judges, for instance, says um, a theme that they use over and over again is right in their own eyes. Um, and so every single time you see they did what was right in their own eyes, the author is going to implement this and it's going to be a, a underlying message or meaning behind it. Um, and, and rather than doing what was right in God's eyes, right in the sight of God, where they're going to do what was right in their own eyes. And so they're going to repeat those themes and those phrases. Um, there may also be points in the narratives, which there are what I've called hard right turns. Now we've all know this. It's where we are talking about something um, and then there'll be a sudden uh, hard right turn. I, I used this example in the past when you're a kid and you play that old game, um, duck, 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 goose. And it's that goose. It's it's repeating those words and phrases, but then there'll be a hard right turn and we're going to be talking about a goose. And, and this is a, a great 
um, example of how an author will suddenly catch the reader's attention. Um, uh, another time is when they are overly detailed, um, like if they are in a summary portion of, of a narrative, but then they go in and they zoom in on a very specific individual, a specific time frame, a specific, specific event. These are all ways that you are supposed to catch up, catch on to when the author is winking at you. Um, and these winks are going to cause you to slow down, to reread, and then to begin to make links, what, what I've called hyperlinking to other narratives that are going to do the exact same things. And when you begin to recognize those hyperlinks to other stories, and pat, and you're going to notice repeated patterns, repeated words and phrases, you begin to juxtapose those two things together, together those two elements together. And that's where the cool stuff happens. That's where you find the treasure. And so this is written in a way in which you can read each individual narrative and gain some sort of wisdom out of it. But if for the reader who is in touch and in tune to what the tool set that the authors are using, um, to that reader, that's where you find the really, really amazing stuff. That's what it's like when you begin to meditate on the Word of God. Um, and so last week we talked about that unfolding pattern you know, um, where many of the narrations or narr uh, many of the um, events that are going to be described are going to sit, fit this sort of pattern where there's going to be an Eden element. That Eden element is going to, um, then it's going to end up in, in some sort of a um, violence or, um, or oppression taking place. And in the oppression and violence that takes place, there's suddenly an outcry, right? The blood of um, Cain's brother Abel is crying out from the ground. It's setting up this theme of where the Israelites will begin to outcry to God, and this outcry will come up to God, and he will then raise up a chosen one who will oftentimes be rescued through the waters or help rescue his people through waters into a new um, creation. Um, this person will then offer intercession on behalf of the per of the um, individuals. This is seen at Noah's sacrifice during the Noah and the Ark story up on uh, Mount Ararat. Um, and then God will make some sort of a covenant prom promise um, with the people. And what this is, is this is all being implemented in order to um, begin to reveal an ever pixelating or uh, um, increasingly pixelating picture of Jesus. You see, you read Genesis chapter one and and through three through through the Adam and Eve narrative, and you're beginning to see that God clearly has some sort of plan that He wants to offer, and He is revealing. And until it is the right time, each and every narrative is going to help us um, begin to understand the clearer, ever clearer picture of who Jesus is so that by the time Jesus shows up on the scene in Matthew chapter one, um, it's going to become very clear, um, especially to Christians uh, today. And so that's a quick overview of kind of what we've been talking about throughout um, the last couple of weeks, just setting up a little bit of this idea. Now, if you are going, if you would, I'd love it if you would turn with me to Jonah chapter one. Jonah chapter one. And uh, I'm going to pray over this, um, and I'm just going to ask that God will give us um, the way that Psalms 118, um, verse 18 says it. Um, help us to see. Give us eyes to see um, what he wants us to see. So if you would, I'd love it if you'd pray with me. Father, we're thankful for another opportunity to dive into your word. I pray that you will be with this um, Bible study technically, that, that things will go clearly, um, uh, technically correct. But God, that uh, it, it be your message, your meaning behind what we're going to study uh, this morning or this evening, depending on whoever and whenever they're watching this. God, I pray that you just help us to um, discover that tool set and that you will be honored and we will spend time with the word who um, we understand to be you. God, we're thankful for you and we love you in your name. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, open to John chapter 1. Um, unfortunately, there will not be anything on the screen throughout this Bible study. Um, so just bear with me as I will be speaking a million miles a minute. Um, I do want to give you one extra warning. Uh, if this session is going to have quite a bit of what I've called Bible ADHD. Um, this is how my brain works, unfortunately, but it is like a rabbit hole and rabbit hole. But I promise you, if you begin to follow these rabbit holes, there will be a certain um, point to the madness. And so we're going to begin in Jonah chapter one. Um, and so let's just begin to dive in. 
Jonah 1.1. Now. Okay, let's stop. There you go, guys. We made it one whole word into this Bible study. Now. Now, I know many of you, maybe uh, your translation does not say the word now. And what has happened is the interpreters of this particular version have taken something that is there in the Hebrew and have made an interpretive, uh, t- interpretive um, decision when, when creating it, uh, their uh, interpretation. And so what has happened is there is the word of the Lord came to Jonah in the Hebrew, but attached to the word of the Lord came to Jonah is one single little dash that in Hebrew we call a lima. Now, the lima that is added to the beginning of the word of the Lord came to Jonah would imply that it was now it is at this time that the word of the Lord, um, the Hebrew lima itself means and or at this time, um, which can be interpreted as so the word of the Lord came to would be maybe a more literal translation. So the word of the Lord came to uh, Jonah, son of Amittai. The reader needs to slow down here, though, because if it's beginning with this, um, this particular Hebrew lima at this time or so, the word of the Lord, you've got to ask that question, when is this taking place? The author has this context in mind here, and we need to figure out exactly what it what he means uh, when he writes it was at this time or so the word of the Lord came to. Now, if you have a browser that you can pull up and you go to stepbible.org, and you go to Jonah chapter 1-1, one, one, you're going to notice there's a little subtext. These, When you click on this subtext, it should say the, le- the letter A above um, Jonah, son of Amittai. You're going to notice that it has a cross-reference. Now, this is different than a hyperlink. A hyperlink will include cross-references, but not all cross-references are hyperlinks. So cross-references are going to talk about other times that maybe Jonah, the son of Amittai. An overly detailed... Um, description of who this individual is has been given. So the author makes some assumptions here that you know who Amittai is, and if you know who Amittai is, then you'll know who Jonah is, and if you know who Jonah is, you'll know what time frame we are speaking within. Well, the the biblical authors or the interpreters have added some cross-references here, and if you click on the little A uh, subtext, you're going to notice that it'll take us back to 2 Kings chapter 14. Now, uh, on that same exact website, uh, stepbible.org, if you, if you click out to 2 Kings chapter 14 and you go to the top of the um, particular chapter, you can see a little summary. And if you click on the summary button, you're going to notice that there is a uh, real quick, precise summary of what's happening in chapter 14. But then you also notice there's a little bit more detailed one right below it. You can also see the book summary if you click one of the tabs at the top. This is an incredibly helpful thing to give you a quick overview of like the context of the passage that we're about to read. Um, but if you were to click on that um, summary button, you'd notice that it says about three quarters away down the, the bigger summary paragraph. It says Jeroboam II became king of Israel and he ruled for 41 years. Jeroboam II did evil in the sight of God and Jeroboam II restored the boundaries of Israel and recovered Damascus and Hamath. Uh, Jeroboam the second son Zechariah succeeded him as king. Now a read through of this passage notes um, that Israel was one um, was was the one that Jonah was actually sent to deliver God's message to. If you go to that Second Kings um, chapter fourteen, you're going to notice that a familiar person will stand out in this particular um, um, area. Uh, you'll notice that in um, 2 Kings chapter 23, you're getting the Jeroboam, son of Joash, the king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria. Uh, he restored the borders of, of Israel from Libo Hamath and the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant, uh, Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from Gath Hepper. That was verse 25. So verse 25, now we have a second mentioning of this particular Jonah character. And Jonah has now come to, in this setting, he has come to a king who is known for doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, you don't have to be a biblical scholar to understand that this is not a great king. This king 
is not great, but he has a prophet who comes and speaks to him and in return restores the actual borders of Israel um, to the original borders. Now that seems like a good thing. So you're left questioning, is this a good thing? Is this a good king or a bad king? Well, he's a human king, unfortunately. He does what is evil in the sight of the Lord, but he still does something good and restores borders. Um, and if you see this recognizable cycle of sin motif, the Lord saw the affliction of Israel at this point. We get this unrepentant ruler who's oppressing. Then there's an outcry of the people for deliverance. And then um, when you see that the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, which starts in verse 26, for the Lord saw the affliction of Israel was very bitter, for there was none left, bond or free. There was none to help Israel. But the Lord had not said that he would blot out the name of Israel from under the heaven. When you see the outcry of the people, you may also see there is another little cross-reference subtext there. If you click that, it takes you back to chapter 13, one chapter before. Well, this is a repeated motif. Uh, you'll see 13 verse 4. Uh, it says, Then Jeho Jehoahaz sought the favor of the Lord, and the Lord listened to him, for he saw the oppression of Israel and how the king of Syria oppressed him. Immediately, you notice a theme. You're seeing a, a the outcry of the people. You're seeing a different ruler with a different J name, right? And we want to know a little bit more about this guy. So if you were to clearly pull up the summary here, you're going to see in verse 2 of chapter 13 that he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Okay, now we have multiple connections here. We're seeing evil on the side of the Lord. We're seeing the outcry of the people. We're seeing the oppression of a king. Um, and, and so at this point, it, this is the perfect moment for the author to be winking at you, saying you should juxtapose these two narratives together. And when you do, you're going to begin to see this clear templated pattern where 2 Kings 13 starts out in the 23rd year of Joash, the son of uh, Ahaziah, the king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, began to reign. Well, this sounds familiar. This is exactly how 2 Kings 14, the very next chapter, starting in verse 23, says, In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, the king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria. Okay, verse 24 now says, He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Whereas 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 2 says, He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Then you're going to see, so both had evil and sinful rulers. You're going to see both have the anger of the Lord kindled against Israel. So they give them to, into, into oppression. Verse 3 of 2 Kings chapter 13 says this, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Verse 24 says, he re, But he said, um, The king restores the borders of Israel according to the word of the Lord that came through Jonah. Right, So there's no word of the Lord that comes through Jonah. There's a break in the pattern here. In verse 13, there's no Jonah. He continues to be oppressed because of the anger of the Lord. But verse 4 of chapter 13 says, Jehoahaz sought the favor of the Lord, and the Lord listened to him. And so now we have a king who, without a prophet, seeks the favor of God, and then God sees the oppression of Israel and listens to him. And it says in verse 5, The Lord gave Israel a savior, so that they escaped from the hands of the Syrians. So we see a merciful and gracious God and a bad ruler who turns back to God, and then God um, hears the outcry of his people and gives them a savior. However, one chapter later in verse 14, we're going to see that the Lord saw, verse 26, the Lord saw the affliction of the Israel of Israel was bitter, and then, but we see um, in verse twenty-seven that the Lord had not said He would blot out the name of Israel from under the heavens, so He saved them by the hand of Jeroboam. So let's compare. We have two rulers, both of which are doing bad, both of which are doing evil. The later ruler is going to have Jonah come and speak to him, and he's going to then restore the borders of Israel. It does not say that he repented. It just says that he restores the borders of Israel. The earlier ruler seeks the favor of God. He, he repents and turns to God, and God hears the outcry of the people in both scenarios and rescues both of the people. So you have to ask yourself, was it the repentant king that made God turn? Was it um, the, or was it the king who uh, decided to restore the borders of Israel? Um, was it... A re, was it because of the prophet who spoke in God's name or was there a prophet in the first one? 
So at this point, we have both outcries coming up, both have evil rulers, both have different outcomes as far as who that ruler will do, what that ruler will do. And in both situations, God is going to deliver them. All right, this is very important to keep in the back of your mind as we read the Jonah narrative. So let's go back to Jonah chapter one. We got it. We, it's during this time that we're going to see um, Jonah chapter one begin to take place. So it was at this time. It says at this time, so Jonah, the son of the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Now, many of us know the story of Jonah and our, um, we have a tendency to want to just jump right into uh, who Nineveh is, what Nineveh is. Maybe you've read some really incredible historical commentaries on Nineveh. I want to challenge you not to do that, right? At this point, I want you to think through this narrative. What is it that the author is assuming we know about Nineveh, that great city? Well, let's just do a search. Let's find out whether somewhere in scripture, that great city, Nineveh, is, is, um, uh, shows up. Now, if you're on stepbible.org or Blue Letter Bible, you can click on Nineveh and you can search. Off to the right, you'll see Nineveh is uh, set up a certain amount of times. If you click that, my hint or tip to you is to go back to the very first mention of Nineveh, because usually this is going to be the foundational um, point through which uh, one will discover what Nineveh is going to mean and be thematically all throughout Scripture. Well, you're going to see Nineveh is mentioned the first time in Genesis chapter 10. Now, if you've got titles above the sections of your Bible, you may see that this is um, the Table of Nations. You may see that this is um, Descendants of Cain. And um, if you go to Genesis chapter 10, you can begin to read about Nineveh. Genesis chapter 10 starts out and says, these are the generations of the sons of Noah. So we have Noah. We have post-flood Noah. He has three sons. Ham is the one who sees the nakedness of his father and his grandchildren, Canaan, will be cursed. So we're going to look at the sons of Ham, starting in verse 6. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Cush and Egypt, and Canaan. I wonder if any of these, Cush, Egypt, and Canaan, are going to play big roles in the future of the, uh, of, uh, the, the scriptures. Real big, interesting. The sons of Cush were Seba and Sabada, uh, Sabta, Rama, Sabteka. The sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. Nimrod. So Cush has Nimrod. Nimrod becomes a mighty man. Well, this sounds familiar. If you were to look at Gibor, the Hebrew word mighty man, the first usage of that appears just a few pages before this in Genesis chapter 6. When you get this really weird passage about these heavenly or divine beings, sons of God coming and having um, children with human women, you're seeing a messed up seed occur, um, genetically messed up seed occur in a spiritual and physical rebellion of the people, which ends in the flood narrative. And so you're watching decreation taking place the way that the Bible says it. It says the end of all flesh coming up before God, right? And so something happens, but the offspring of the, this um, union of these divine beings for, and humans are the Nephilim, the mighty warriors, the mighty men of renown of the name. Okay, so we can immediately kind of have a bitter taste in our mouth whenever we read about these mighty men. Well, let's go back to chapter 10. Nimrod is the first on earth after the flood to be in to become a mighty man, a, a mighty hunter. Now, this is a whole rabbit hole that we're not going to go down at the moment. Um, but um, it is very interesting that he became a mighty one. So what does Nimrod do? Well, Nimrod, the beginning of his kingdom in verse 10 is Babel, Babylon. I wonder if that one's going to come into play later in the future. So Nimrod, this mighty hunter, begins Babylon, which means he's at the Tower of Babel event, right? Um, he, they ha uh, it, it, he also founded Erech, Akkad, and Kalne, the land of Shinar, out of which um, Abraham's going to come. And from this land, he went into Assyria and he built Nineveh. 
So Nimrod, the founder of Babylon, goes into Assyria and builds Nineveh, Rehoboth-ur, and Calais, and the resin between Nineveh and Calais. That is this great city. So what has happened now is you've got Nineveh, a like a combination of several city states, basically that 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 is counted or close enough together that they, it is considered the great city. Now, in the author of Jonah is going to mention Nineveh and tie it in with this passage by mentioning that it is that great city. And so, when reading these two passages together, you're you're to understand there's a whole depth of meaning behind. Just saying Nineveh, that great city, because we understand that it is founded by a Gibor, a mighty hunter, Nimrod, who also founded Babel, um, which caused dispersed d- dispersed ag- across the earth. Ba- the Babel event, Babylon event, was man trying to make a name for themselves alongside apparently this offspring of a divine being. Um, and so you get to Jonah and you see that Nineveh itself is this city that he, that Jonah is being called to go and speak to. And these are an evil, wicked people who have oppressed Israel for, you know, pages and pages of the Bible. This is the exact, um, like, picture of sin and outcry of blood and city of blood. Um and it is the it is the divine picture, or it is the picture of spiritual and human rebellion together, which you know ended in both the fall of Adam and Eve and in the flood narrative. And so when you have divine and human rebellion taking place, like Nineveh becomes the picture perfect place for the representation of what divine. Um, spiritual and human rebellion from God looks like. In fact, the way that um, the way that uh, the outcome of that spiritual rebellion that led to the Nephilim, the the Gibor, the mighty men, was that the evil um, that every the wickedness of man was great in all the earth, and that every intention of man's heart was evil continuously. And so we're talking about some really, really deep, deep stuff subjects here you see in fact this is why in in genesis chapter 6 the lord makes a promise he says i will blot out man whom i have created from the face of the land now we just read this in second kings chapter 14 he god um, recalls that i have not made a promise to blot out israel from all of the land. And so instead, he's going to let them be taken, overtaken, overtaken by the very people um, that Jonah is being called to go and speak to. Um, which is why in Jonah 1, it says, To call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. You see, the author of Jonah is tying all of these narratives together, and you're seeing there are pictures and motifs and themes and and underlying understandings that come along with this particular passage. And right now, it's not Israel that's calling out before God. It is Jonah who is going to call out against the evil that has come up before God, the evil of the outcome of Babylon, of, of Nineveh, of Nimrod, of spiritual and human rebellion. You see, this all goes back to the very first mention of the built city, the first bloodshed mentioned in the Bible. After Adam and Eve are removed from the garden, they're still in Eden, and Cain uh, kills his brother uh, Abel in a fit of jealousy. And God's God makes that proclamation: the blood of your brothers, or the the cry of your brothers' blood, is 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 calling out from the rocks. And so Cain is meant to go east of Eden. God gives him a divine gift of mercy by marking him so that nobody will try to kill him. And if they did, they would be cursed. And he's set to be a wanderer and a foreigner in the earth. And it tells us several times he's to be a wanderer. He's going to wander. And what does he do? Well, he goes and he has a kid, and he Enoch, and then he builds a city. I I would say that's the opposite of uh, wandering. 
And that city is east of Eden. That city will be the first picture of the city or nations of blood in the Bible. The thing that Babylon and Nineveh will become is started in the Cain narrative and the, the outcry of the innocent blood that was spilt um, in jealousy and in, in, in rage and in, in many and taking advantage of, of lesser. And so as we read the Jonah narrative, these are all things that you want to keep in mind um, because there is a theological um, message that's going to be revealed throughout this time. And you're supposed to be left questioning who the good people are, who the bad people are, what good they're doing, what bad they're doing, and where is God in all of these things? Because what we're seeing so far is in the king's narratives, we see God is merciful no matter what leader or repentance or savior God raises up. In the Cain narrative, he's merciful and still marking Cain who spilt the blood of his brother. Um, and even in the flood narrative, he chooses a righteous remnant, not just a righteous and blameless Noah, but those who are connected to him get to go through the waters of decreation into a new creation. So his family and family's wives get to go into the new creation. And so we're getting this ever pixelating picture of who Jesus is and it's being revealed to us. And as we begin to read um, this narrative of Jonah, uh, it's going to bring up some really interesting questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. You can email me at adam at firstnederland.com. Um, or find me on Facebook. And uh, I hope that you've enjoyed this Bible study. And uh, this week, your challenge is to read Genesis chapter 18, 22 through 19, 29, and to make note of any themes or motifs that you notice um, in re repeating patterns um, throughout this passage and be prepared next week as we um, dive in a little deeper into Jonah chapter one. Uh, I hope that you guys have a wonderful day.